for joining us. Today uh, on our Transition Cow Tuesdays, we're gonna be talking about feeding the transition cow. Today's slides were prepared by myself, Betsy Hicks, a part of the South Central New York Dairy and Field Crops Program with Cornell Cooperative Extension. Dave Belvian, who we'll hear from in a little bit with the Central New York Dairy Live Cop Crops and Field Program. And then Margaret Quasdorf uh, will join us for Q&A at the end. She is with the Northwest New York Dairy Livestock and Field Crops Program. Our topics for today, we're gonna go over feeding behavior, the why, we're gonna go over space recommendations, the what, and uh, do some feed mixing and delivery, which we're calling the how. And then at the end, we'll do some other important considerations. So to start out with, we're gonna talk about the cow's dining experience. So this slide is adapted from Rick Grant of Minor Institute. So what Rick says is in a perfect world, the cow can eat when she wants, she can eat without competition, and she can lie down comfortably after she eats. If we do those three things, life is really good for the cow. Ways to improve this whole dining experience. If she has a properly mixed TMR, uh, if she has feed available to her whenever she wants, um, good adequate bunk space, that's a huge one. And then including proper rest, and uniform feed delivery, as well as feed push-ups, All of those things contribute to improving the dining experience for the cow. Conversely, we can also do things to hurt the dining experience. So if we think about all those things on the last slide uh, that we do to our cows when they're trying to eat, you know, we have a poorly mixed TMR, um, or there's no feed in that bunk, it's an empty feed bunk, or we're really cramming a lot of cows into that that bunk, uh, we're limiting her bunk space. Um, or there's a lot of cows in that pen and she's not able to get the rest when she wants. Um, again, feed not delivered uniformly, that proper, poorly mixed TMR or a timely uh, mix uh, delivered to the cows. Or again, if cows can't reach feed, all of these things contribute to a poor dining experience for the cow. So why is this uh, feed dining experience important? Well, feeding behavior drives dry matter intake. Whether we're talking about lactating cows or transition cows, pre-fresh, whatever we're talking about, this feeding behavior drives our dry matter intake. So we can talk about dry matter intake for pounds a day according to feeding time, that's the minutes a day she eats, her feeding rate, how many pounds per minute she will eat, her meal size, how many pounds she eats in a meal, and then meal frequency, how many meals per day she's eating and how long her meal takes her minutes per meal. So this study on the left is uh, talking about Bach and DeVries, uh, both reference this thought. A cross-sectional study of 47 herds fed the exact same ration, found that 56% of the variation in observed milk production between herds was explained by non-dietary factors. For example, the presence or absence of feed refusals, the freestyle talk, stocking density, and whether feed was pushed up in the feed bunk, all the things we talked about that hurt or helped the dining experience. So we want to, of course, maximize intake by promoting favorable feeding behaviors. So we can maximize it uh, and we can achieve better room and health by utilizing feeding management strategies that promote the feeding favorable feeding behaviors. So some of these strategies are encouraging more frequent and smaller meals through the day, having her be able to eat whenever she wants, reducing sorting, making sure we have that proper mix that's delivered, and then encouraging cows to stand longer after milking, which of course is you know for the lactating cows. So how else can we promote more desirable feeding behaviors? So TMR delivery acts as the primary motivating factor for cows to consume feed. We know that cows fed just once a day have large peaks in feeding activity immediately following feeding. This can predispose cows to subacute ruminal acidosis. If we feed more than two times a day or two times a day, this will promote more evenly spaced feeding events. This increases our dry matter intake, it improves rumen, rumen pH, and it improves feeding opportunities for those subordinate cows. Also, pushing up feed frequently throughout the day ensures cows always have access to the feed. This is not an unknown thing, right? But it, it, it deserves being talked about more. So when we push up feed, 
More frequently, it associates with an increased lying duration. Cows spend less time waiting for their feed. It results in less sorting opportunities and it optimizes production as well as minimizing the variation in the TMR that they're actually eating. So I wanted to talk a little bit now about first calf heifers in particular and their feeding behavior, which is really important to, to take note of. So we know heifers eat slower, they take smaller bites, they tend to be more timid than mature cows and they get pushed around easier. In addition to this, it usually takes them 10 to 14 days to get used to a new environment. So we've put together some grouping strategies uh, on this slide that talk about when we group cows pre-fresh with heifers and cows. So this study from Aspina et al. in which a larger freestyle dairy farm, uh, they almost exclusively commingled cows and heifers during the immediate prepartum period. And that suggested that a staggering 70% of herds had more than 25% of their primiparous animals with elevated NIFAs during the prepartum period. And that clearly indicated that dry matter intake was compromised in those first calf heifers. Uh, nearly 50% of herds had more than 25% of their primiparous animals with elevated NIFAs during the postpartum period. So this study absolutely shows us when we group them together, we're, we're compromising so many things. So some grouping of prefresh cows and heifers, we know that the effects of facility management and environment are not equal across all animals. Heifers tend to be more negatively affected and have higher stress responses. Cook and Norlin talk about this in their 2004 paper. And then, uh, especially when stocking density is high, we see really large effects on our heifers. So we know it's best to separate heifers and cows whenever possible. Post-fresh with our lactating cows, if we mix first lactation cows with the mature cows, with dry matter intake, we see a 10% reduction in dry matter intake. These losses uh, in body weight are greater by 30 days of milk in those heifers. In behavior, these heifers spend less time drinking and less time ruminating. And with milk production, where we you know, visually see this in the tank, they have a lower milk fat percentage and there's a 9% reduction in milk uh, production when those heifers are grouped with mature cows. So lots of things to take into consideration when we decide to group our heifers with our mature cows, whether pre-fresh or post-fresh, we have to make sure we're taking these into consideration. If we have to mix them, let's try to mix them with all these things in mind. All right, so Dave's gonna talk next about some feeding considerations. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about feed bunk space. Um, so when you think about feed bunk space, uh, basically really nothing is set in stone. Uh, just, I guess the one thing I would say is remember that your pre-fresh and fresh cow groups, those are your most vulnerable cows when it comes to metabolic problems related to time budgets, cow comfort and social interactions. So guidelines out there from a few different places, uh, University of Wisconsin Dairyland uh, initiative guidelines are 30 inches uh, for both pre-fresh and fresh cows, whether it's headlocks or a feed rail. And they say basically to ensure that all cows can eat at the same time. If you think of, uh, if you look at University of Kentucky, they say 30 inches per cow with headlocks, 36 inches per cow with a feed rail. Um, this would be for fresh cows, where basically boss cows can really uh, rule the roost, so to speak. And 36 inches for both headlocks and feed rail in pre-fresh cows. So uh, take a look at your own situation. Those are pretty generous guidelines uh, that I'll, I'll bet uh, most herds are not, uh, are not achieving. Uh, you also need to take a look at calving patterns. We know they're not even in every herd year round. Uh, so ask yourself, can you achieve these goals every month of the year? Uh, again, uh, Google Dairyland Initiative and go to Transition Cow Housing. Uh, there's some spreadsheets set up there. You can put your herd information in. It'll basically give you some projections uh, that can be helpful. Another thing to think about is your pre-fresh cows are using stalls uh, rather than a pack. Uh, review stall sizes. Uh, these cows are heavy with calf. Uh, should these stalls be a little bit larger? Uh, not something that you can change uh, uh, immediately, but if you're looking at uh, new facilities or remodel facilities, something to keep in mind from a standpoint of stall sizes. 
All right. So think. Let's think about overcrowding during the transition period. Um, if you look back at some work that was done with uh, Huzzy in 2011, uh, they looked at overstocking stalls, basically a, a half a stall versus one stall for cow versus, and also bunk space, 13 inches versus 26 inches. Uh, again, that increased NEFA and fetal cortisol metabolites in far off cows. Uh, headlock stocking density, um, basically uh, greater than 80 to 90% of manger space or less than 30 inches per cow in the close up pen, reduce feed intake, increase DA incidence, and reduce milk yield in first calf heifers. Uh, this was work done in 2004. Um, looking at uh, uh, pens, basically, close up pen. Uh, less than 100 square foot per cow in close-up pens reduce lying time and rumination, increase the incidence of milk fever. Uh, this was work done by Cook in 2004. Uh, greater than 100% stocking density in bunks and in fresh pens increased eating rate. Uh, this was work back in 2010. Uh, this slide basically was from Heather Dan at Minor Institute looking at overcrowding. So all of the evidence is pointing that uh, to the fact that overcrowding in this transition period really causes lots and lots of problems. And we've known some of this for quite a number of years. Here's a, here's a picture. Uh, this is actually at uh, Meyer Institute taking a look at a close-up pen. Uh, just kind of take a look at, at the kind of space there is there. This is basically 110 square foot uh, per animal in a pack. So here's a close-up pen. This is with first calf heifers at 150 square feet per animal. Uh, big difference there. And uh, these are basically uh, pretty dramatic from a standpoint of what, what the spacing looks like. All right, let's talk a little bit about water access. Uh, pretty important uh, uh, thing to think about that oftentimes is overlooked or not given enough, uh, enough attention. Dairyland Initiative says three and a half inches of linear uh, space, trot space per cow. Um, Kentucky says three inches. Um, this is basically based on the maximum number of animals that are going to be in that pen. So uh, think about not only what you have today, but what's the maximum that's going to be in there. Uh, there ought to be a minimum of two waterers per pen. Uh, cows should be no more than 50 feet away from a water trot at any one time. Um, one thing we sometimes don't think about is recovery. In other words, how fast does the water flow into these troughs? So if you have multiple cows wanting to drink at the same time, uh, basically they suck that trough dry and then basically there's no water there or not enough there. Uh, so, so check on that uh, as well. Uh, be sure to check on water quality. Uh, lots of details go in there, but uh, we'll just say check that and clean these waters at least weekly. We know they can get contaminated and we've got to keep these clean, um, doing everything that we can to uh, create a good environment for these animals. So let's talk a little bit about moving cows between pens. Again, this is a, a slide I got from Heather Dan at Minor. Um, move cows later in the day, not near feeding time. Um, no pen move should occur within one week of calving. Uh, cows should spend at least nine days in a close-up pen, closer to 14 to 21. Um, and I think most of us are, are probably achieving that. Uh, think about introducing fresh heifers when we have to uh, uh, put them in with older cows in pairs, at least in pairs, and maybe more than that if we can, uh, when we're grouping them with older animals. Um, promotes greater lying time after mixing. Never move a single animal. Um, it basically puts them in a real bad situation. Um, and, you know, there's some thought, I guess, depending on herd size facilities, to think about having contiguous close up and fresh pens. In other words, kind of following a little bit on that uh, kind of all in and all out kind of an approach. Uh, that's something that can't work for everybody, but something to think about and consider. This, this was looked at, at Baird, by Baird back in 2002, so essentially about 20 years ago. So here's a slide again from Heather at Minor. Um, basically, we oftentimes don't think about the social interactions of these animals. Um, and, and basically by moving animals together, it helps to create that social group. Here's just a little cartoon that says, hello, my name is Belle and I've been dry for 30 to 45 days. 
and uh, she's basically on her own. So, uh, you know, that social interaction is a lot more important than we've ever given it credit for. And we're starting to learn a lot more about that. All right, let's talk a little bit about feed mixing and delivery. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, we'd like to see fresh TMR uh, fed to pre-fresh and fresh cows at least twice a day, along with multiple push-ups. And these push-ups are really most important immediately following free, fresh feed delivery. Uh, cows are crepuscular, in other words, they're active during dawn and dusk. If we're following natural behaviors, these are good times to dispense fresh feed. Um, basically in the morning and then late afternoon, just as uh, we're approaching uh, evening or dark. Uh, for fresh cows, having fresh feed, this would be in our, in our fresh cow group, having fresh feed when cows are exiting the parlor is an ideal time. Uh, lots and lots of benefits there. Uh, the combination of feed dispensing and push-ups should be done at least eight times a day. Uh, if cows can't reach feed, consider it as unavailable. Um, and feed bunks basically should be empty no more than two hours in a 24 hour period. So these practices along with generous uh, feed bunk space really helps to improve the opportunities for these subordinate cows and especially first calf heifers if we are not able to separate them, but separate them if you can. So here's some cautions and what I call watch out items, okay? Be sure no feed is left in the mixer prior to mixing a pre-fresh batch. This should be done for any group, but if it happens with your pre-fresh cows, it can be particularly disastrous from a nutritional standpoint. Um, it's surprising uh, the things that happen with these mixer wagons, and it's a whole nother topic, but just kind of keep your eyes and ears open and take a look inside once in a while, see what's going on. Uh, we typically wanna limit energy intake in these pre-fresh diets, yet maintain a high level of dry matter intake. This usually means some high bulk feeds such as straw or poor quality hay. Um, sorting of these uh, rations is problematic. Uh, cows basically unbalance their diet when they're sorting and we have poor outcomes. Small load sizes can be problematic with small pre-fresh groups. Uh, load size issues typically re revolve around overfilling mixer wagons. Uh, most wagons do not indicate minimum load sizes, uh, even in their uh, owner's manual. Pay attention, observe the TMR, uh, maybe consider doing a TMR audit, but just kind of a word of caution with small batch sizes and the kind of mixing that's done and the results that we're getting. Um, best results occur when these coarse dry feed are pre-processed at harvest, and then additionally processed with a hay buster or roto grind. Uh, TMR mixers do not do an adequate job in reducing particle size. Uh, shoot for a particle size of one inch and no more than an inch and a half. And that can be checked with a Penn State separator. Your nutritionist should be able to do that for you. So here's, uh, again, I got a lot of uh, <laughs> slides from Heather Dan. She was very generous in sharing that. But here's some guidelines as far as particle size for straw. And this would apply also to dry hay. Uh, baleage or any feed of that sort that you're trying to reduce particle size. What we're shooting for, 20% on the top screen, 40% on the next screen, 20% on the third, and no more than 20% in the pan. So studies show that this makes a difference. Actually, some work done by uh, Casey Havacase. She's actually uh, one of the dairy specialists on our North, uh, Northern New York team. Uh, she worked with uh, Trevor DeVries at the University of Guelph in Ontario and did a lot of work taking a look at this. They looked at chopped uh, wheat straw and a high straw diet and, and found that uh, when it was chopped well, it improved intake, reduced sorting during the dry period and improved metabolic health and rumen stability and early lactation. Then they added water in another trial to a high straw diet. Uh, and found that it may improve intake and reduce sorting against these largest particles, which again may help promote consistency and targeted nutrients consumed during the dry period and greater rumen health and early lactation. Then they looked at adding liquid molasses to a high straw diet and found that that may improve intake consistency and nutrients consumed during the dry period and early lactation, as well as promoting better rumen health across the transition period. So basically, trying to get some consistency from a standpoint of intake, reduce sorting, 
All these things can be tremendously beneficial to these cows uh, that are basically kind of in a, in a tenuous situation as they go through this transition period. So he, here's some common ways common cows consume too much energy in a properly formulated diet. Just take a look at these pictures here. The one on the far right, look at the holes basically. We see these cows have been sorting like crazy and we can see some of the coarse material. The center picture, all this dry long hay at the very end and very little uh, mixed in and we can see that cows have been sorting. The picture on the left, um, you know, I guess use your own judgment there. I mean, you can see some long particles there, but that certainly looks a lot better than the other ones. So Betsy is going to uh, talk a little bit now about some special considerations uh, to think about. Yeah, so Dave and I and Margaret, we all wanted to close out this session with some special considerations uh, for this really important uh, period. Now, everybody knows the transition cow period is, is really, really critical. So your nutritionist should absolutely be the center of conversations. Um, and so we put together some things that should be talked about. So we've talked about different strategies uh, with dry cows. And we've heard from Dr. Overton uh, earlier in this series about strategies and, and feeding transition cows and nutrition. But things you should talk about is with your nutritionist is, okay, what is our grouping strategy? Do we have one group? Do we have a far off and prefresh? Do we mix cows in there? So what, what are our goals of those groups? And what is our strategy for making sure that we're achieving those goals? Some other things, and, and I put DCAD down here, for instance, you know, I, is DCAD a consideration? Is there a way that we can use DCAD in our groups um, or in particular hand ads on farm? If we're going to put hand ads on farm to try and save money, um, you know, what is the strategy with that? And I have monitoring strategies at the very end. So whatever things you're picking with those three areas, uh, DCAD additives, whatever it may be. What is your way of monitoring those things? Is the nutritionist gonna monitor it? Are you relying on somebody else on farm to do those monitoring strategies? I'm talking about monitoring for BHB or uh, urine pHs. What, what, what is the strategy for monitoring how these things are resulting in our cows? And then you know, flip side, how are metabolics and uh, what cow response are telling us? Who's monitoring that? And how frequently are we meeting with our nutritionists to talk about what they're doing with the diet and, and the results that we're getting on farm. Those things are absolutely paramount to having a successful transition period. Uh, Margaret put together this next slide and it's talking about feed additives and in particular the 4R concept uh, from Dr. Mike Hutchins at the University of Illinois. Everybody knows uh, Dr. Hutchins and knows his four R's. So first, response from the cows. Performance changes the farm can expect when an additive is included include perhaps higher milk yield, peaker persistency, increased milk components, greater dry matter intake, better digestion in the rumen, reduced stress, better overall health, better, more efficient growth. What is the response that we're looking to get from a feed additive? Secondly, return. We should have a, a clear and uh, a good benefit to cost ratio. An additive should return $2 for every dollar invested. So for instance, in our transition period, anionic salts have a 10 to one return. Um, and those should cost between 40 and 75 cents per cow per day. Rumen protected choline has a two to one return in costs. Um, this should, the cost should be about 30 cents per transition cow per day. Rumensin or Menensin has a five to one return and costs about three cents per cow per day. So we should know what is the cost ratio. It needs to be greater than two to one. If it's really unclear, we need to say, okay, are there some things that are not tangible that uh, we're getting a return on, but we're not exactly able to get a cost benefit ratio. Thirdly, research. Uh, this additive that you're thinking about including should have an unbiased uh, research backing it that proves the additive is doing what it claims to do. Not all additives come with research and not all research is unbiased. Fourthly, results and records from, from your farm records. Do you see the results of the additive working in your farm? Are there improvements in herd health, fresh cow performance, production performance, health of the cows? 
And can you document them back to when you put that additive in or took that additive out? Um, and then lastly, and this is Margaret's fifth R, is it relevant? So is this additive relevant to your situation? Think about, think through this with your nutritionist. Does it make sense given the amount of cows this is going to, which groups it's going to and the time of year? Are there other management factors that you can apply to avoid spending money on an additive? Uh, as you know, if we think about using it as a band-aid or a cover up for poor management, can we back up and do things better from a farm management perspective? A good nutritionist will be able to discuss these topics with you and management strategies that are appropriate and relevant for you to implement. So lastly, this is our last slide here, communication. Communication to have a successful transition cow program has to happen. The herds person has to be listening to the cows and we have to, to talk through things with the owner, the nutritionist, and we can't forget about the feeder. All of these things we've talked about today, it has to be uh, a multiple direction street of traffic, right? This has to have communication from all aspects in order for this, this transition program to be as successful as it can be. So with that, we thank you. Margaret, Dave, and I are all here in order to take your questions.